Is there questions? Is there anybody want to keep me? Well, I'm interested in the current status of uh, Daniel McGowan. I, I don't know his story because I was kind of not involved in that at all. Uh, so you could probably ask. Um, yeah, he's on the table. And uh, Daniel did seven years in federal prison. Um, and he did a lot of his time in a place called the Communications Management Unit, which is like the it's a prison within a prison. They, they severely restrict the amount of communication you have on the outside. You get like one phone call a week or something like that. It can be like 15 minutes long. You have very few people who can visit you. So you have very, very limited communication with people on the outside. Um, they did that even though he was he was designated for medium security facility. They put him in the worst prison they could find because they didn't want him communicating with the movement, influencing the movement in the world. But anyway, Daniel got out, served his time, got out, and uh, he had six months sort of uh, halfway house period. Now he's out of that. He's back with his family in New York, City. and uh, he is under some kind of conditional release at the moment, so he can't. It's limited what he can do, what he can speak about publicly, and who he can interact with. But he's doing well. He's working. He's going through everything Peg was just talking about. A lot of adjustments, and everyone seems to get out of prison has to go through a lot of adjustments. Yeah. If they're if they're fortunate enough to be able to adjust, uh, so Dan is struggling with that, but he's doing well. He's he's doing uh, work with the movement um, through a, a law firm. Last I heard, that represents political prisoners and stuff like that. So he's doing well, and I think someday in the near future, or maybe. Someone in your future will hear from you in person. We're lucky. I love it. So this movie, if you haven't seen it, I highly, highly recommend it because it's way more relevant to you now and what's, what's going on now than what went on with us. But there is a movie that's coming out called Wrench, and it's about the legacy of Ed Abbey, and um, his legacy is definitely part of our story, and we are featured in that movie, our experience and that sort of thing. So um, it's uh, going to go to Sundance, I think. So you guys will probably see it, and I'm sure you'll be showing it when it comes out. So anybody else? Oh, you talked about <coughs> getting through, you know, the hard times and having a spiritual path and stuff. But um, do you have any other uh, basic points of like processing fear or getting through, yeah. you know, periods of depression? <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's all very important. Um, I don't know. Um, there's a way to process fear uh, where you're not trying to suppress it or trying to ignore it or trying to deny it. Fear is real and it's very important. Um, all of the emotions are really important for us and if you get really angry, it's a very good um, energetic emotion to help you do something. Just be very strategic about what it is you're doing and don't do it in anger. Use the anger to get you to the place where you can do the action. With fear, there were times when I would have panic attacks um, because the feds know what's important to me. And, and I, you know, my little dog, I was like, oh my God, maybe they're going to kill her or something like that. And so um, I would have a panic attack and I would, it's what you, there, what I, would, I do a lot of meditation, I do prayer work, I am very grounded in a spiritual path. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, whatever spiritual path it is, if it resonates with you, then it's your spiritual path. There are many t ways to talk about them. So mine uh, consists of a lot of uh, earth-based stuff and pagan type stuff. And, but I, you know, I grew up Catholic, so I use some of that shit. I use everything. And, um, so one of the things that I like to do is welcome fear into my sphere. So I, I, I open myself up to welcome it in. And I say, okay, fear, I want you to be here and feel welcome. You're welcome here. And I observe where it is in my body, what it feels like, what it looks like. If it travels, I just allow it to do that. If it gets big, I allow it to get as big as it's going to get. And I just wait for it to get as big as it's going to get. And I ask it very politely that, and just escort it through so that it can be processed in the ethers elsewhere, not in me. And then that void that's left, I fill with light and love. And love is, that's it. That's it. 
So I'm not angry. I'm not angry at the FBI agent. I had to do some ceremonial stuff to get him out of my aura because he really did take a piece of me. And so um, I had dreams when I first was dealing with him. Uh, when I was dealing with going to jail and all that kind of stuff. I went to jail for three months and then we got out on bail and then we had to wait a couple of years and we had to do all this stuff and, and you know, process things and that. But I had these dreams where he was chasing me in a Volkswagen van and he was, you know, throwing all the shame on me and everything. And so I, what I did, this is my own personal deal, everybody has their own way of doing it. I took a candle, a, a beeswax candle, and I wrote his name on it all of his names, the ones that I knew and the ones that were his real names. And I burned the candle down and I closed the circle around it and I just ranted and raved until I was done with all the anger that I had in me and all the angst and fear and all that kind of crap. And when it burned to the finish, I opened the circle and I banished him from my all. I banished him from my thoughts. I banished him. So he doesn't come back. It was him that was coming to me. I wasn't drawing him in, but he had brought himself into my sphere and was going through his own angst and his own stuff and trying to project it onto me. He has to deal with that, you know. I have, I have no doubt that before we came into this incarnation that he and I were up flipping a coin on who was going to be the bad guy and who was going to be the good guy this time. Mm -hmm. I know that I've probably been in some other lifetimes with him and, I, and he got to be the bad guy. So, so be it. And I don't know if that'll help, but anybody else? Yes? Uh, can I request a song? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. It's going to be perfect a while, right? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody, okay. somebody really liked it yesterday. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh cool. All right. Well, for everybody, I'm going to. Um, I have an <coughs> album that I did like in '94 called Clear Horizon, and I didn't bring a copy because I sold them out and I was just forgot. It's like driving down the road and I'm like, oh my god, I forgot my CD. So, anyways, I'm going to send one to these guys. They're going to make some copies. If you want copies of it, there's 25 songs on them. And it's, you know, it's me singing a cappella, and uh, it's called Clear Horizon because after I got out of jail, it was like I had a clear horizon. The first album I did was called Gentle Warrior, and that's what I did before I went into prison. And it's, you know, I'm sitting there with a monkey wrench, and it was my sort of like raspberry to the feds because it's like, yeah, maybe you can shut me up and put me in jail, but I've got music out there. <laughs> so, um, and so I'll, I'll get that stuff to these guys, and they'll, they'll make some if you guys are interested. So this song, Forever Wild, has great history. It's written by a guy named Jim Stoltz. He was a major, major troubadour in our movement. He was very involved with Earth First in a lot of ways, and he was, um, but he also was very involved in Middle America. So he walked miles and miles and miles with his guitar Stella, and, um, and he would write these beautiful songs, and then he would take beautiful pictures, and then he would go on the road. Half the year he was walking in the wilderness and the other half of the year he was advocating for wilderness and so he would go driving around and, and set up his, his slideshow in places just like this and he would sing his songs and he had this beautiful baritone voice but I'm not going to sing that. So um, the first time I saw him singing I was around a campfire and I was crying my eyes out. And, um, and then he sang in front of a judge after he got arrested for the first time in his life at a demo we were doing at the Yellowstone National Park. And <clears throat> my lawyer told me that <coughs> he wanted me to, we were unable to speak in our trial. They wouldn't let us use the defenses that we wanted to use. They were just completely, it was just ridiculous. So we were just like sitting there with these lawyers debating over stuff. It was like I was sitting at some game that I was not involved in, and, and, but the, my fate was, you know, going to be determined by what these people were saying. And so, um, but nobody was going to let me talk. So finally, the, the, we had our sentencing, and we were supposed to go in and tell our sort of talk or whatever. So everybody, there was five of us. There was Mark Davis, Mark Baker, Ilse Asplund, myself, and 
Deformin. Now they drug Deformin in sort of by the cuffs because he had, he had edited this book, um, the um, Field Guide to Monkey Ranching, and they tried, they tried so hard to get him involved, but he wasn't involved. He had nothing to do with us. He was just, you know, he's our first guy and he was big and visible and all that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, I get this harebrained idea that I'm going to sing a song and uh, my lawyer was like, what? And uh, I said, yeah, I'm going to sing a song. So um, he got really behind the idea after a while and um, at the time I was doing the Yang form of Tai Chi so that I could deal with all this stuff. And I went in the bathroom and I was scared to death and I, it's my turn and everybody's, you know, talking about Jefferson and freedom and all this kind of stuff and I just go, you know, nobody got to hear about why we are doing this. Nobody was never even allowed in here. So I'm going to tell you why I'm here. There's a magic in the air. We are letting them know the answer. 